Michael Stevens bought it for 90,000. It was German, then Irish and Italian. It gave birth to photographer Dorothea Lang and an Italian boy they called The Voice. Brando and Kazan used its waterfront. Some 300 year old... Now it's your turn to take a walk through Hoboken with David Hartman and historian Barry Lewis. Well, Barry Lewis and I are at it again. We're off on another walking tour. Uh, I'm David Hartman. This is the first time that we have started on the water. Uh, we're on a ferry on the Hudson River heading west from Manhattan. And when we next hit land, it will be Hoboken, New Jersey. Now, Hoboken is a small city, but it has been a very important part of the life in New York for over 300 years. It is now, and it certainly is going to be in the future. There's a comic film from the 1940s or 50s. I think it's uh, Abbott and Costello goes to Mars, and one of the characters says, Mars? Mars? Is that anywhere near Hoboken? <laughs> <laughs> that line must have been written by a New Yorker because that is what we thought of Hoboken and the rest of the Jersey Shore. Well, there's a new Hoboken, and it's been renewed for the last 35 years. You know, back in the 1970s, the artists and musicians of Manhattan escaping the high prices of Manhattan discovered Hoboken over here on the other side of the Hudson River, right across from the village and Chelsea neighborhoods of Manhattan. It was connected to the city by the PATH train, so you didn't need a car. They realized it was an intact 19th century city that the 20th century had passed by. Their instincts were so right. Well, as a result of this popularity, in 1989, New York Waterways put back the old ferry system that was abandoned in 1967. Now there are ferries coming from Hoboken Terminal and North Hoboken to all parts of the city, you know? New Yorkers' eyes glaze over when you say Hoboken, when you say Jersey. But as we pull into the shore and we get a fabulous view of the old Erie Lackawanna Terminal, they call it now the Hoboken Terminal, we're going to show people in the next hour of walking around Hoboken, there definitely is life on the other side of the Hudson. Major funding for a walk through Hoboken with David Hartman and historian Barry Lewis is provided by Marsh and McLennan Companies. Hoboken, New Jersey may only be one mile square, but it's where the first commercial steam ferry service ferried. It's where the first modern zipper zipped. It's where the first American steam locomotive chugged. Many even say it's where the first ice cream cone crunched. At MMC, we love Hoboken's ability to inspire. In fact, it inspired us to make it part of our home. Marsh and McLennan Companies, the parent of Marsh, Putnam & Mercer. Additional funding is provided by SJP Properties. SJP Properties develops, owns, and manages commercial property throughout the New York Metro and has been involved in Hoboken for many years, helping to transform old rail yards and industrial areas into an active, vibrant 24-7 community and PSE&G. PSE&G, delivering energy to 3.5 million New Jersey customers, proudly sponsors this program. Since 1903, New Jersey has been home to PSE&G. As we celebrate a century of service, we affirm our long-standing commitment to New Jersey and its communities like Hoboken. If you look over at Manhattan, we are closer to Manhattan and have a better view of it than we would if we were in Staten Island or Queens or the Bronx or even upper Brooklyn. And we're standing just below the highest point in Hoboken, which isn't saying a lot because I think the upper deck of Yankee Stadium is taller than that. Well, I don't know if Henry Hudson and his crew would get that <laughs> reference. They were the first Europeans who actually mentioned what is today Hoboken. They discover, of course, the Hudson River in 1609. Now, New Yorkers think all Hudson was interested in was Manhattan, Manhattan Island, but they actually looked at the other side of the river, too. And as a matter of fact, Robert Jewett wrote that in the journal of that third Hudson voyage. He said, where we saw a very good piece of ground, and hard by it there was a cliff that looked to the color of white green, as though it were either a copper or silver mine. 
this is really what Hudson saw. First of all, this is one of the early views of the area, 1639. God, look how accurate this map is. Isn't it amazing? I mean, without a GPS that they could figure this out. River and this Manhattan. Yeah, there's Manhattan, of course, the other side of the North River, which is what they used to call the Hudson River. Uh, there, of course, is Hoboken, the area we're talking about. Uh, of course, the cliff was very noticeable, but you know, they also noticed just below the cliff, about a mile below it, there was a little spit of land that stretched out into the water, perfect place for docking a boat. That's why, from the very earliest times, that was the connection between Manhattan Island and what we call Hoboken. It's still the main transport hub and entry to Hoboken. It's where the Hoboken Terminal is today. This is an 1880s aerial view, and it's a wonderful view. Of course, Hoboken's already urbanized, but we are just below that dot. That dot actually is that serpentine cliff. And you can see why they thought it was an island. It's so clearly defined. I mean, geography is destiny, especially in here in Hoboken. First of all, you see how nature confined Hoboken. There's an inlet to the north separating it from today's Weehawken. There's an inlet to the south separating it from today's Jersey City. To the west, the Palisades, 100 feet high. They are a definite western edge to the city. Now, this has all been filled in. Right. Since, right? And, and of course, in time became the, what's called the mile square city of Hoboken, even though it's 1.3 square miles but we're not counting. Now, in colonial America, obviously it was Dutch first, then it was English after the 1660s. During the English colonial period, the Bayards bought this entire property we call Hoboken. They built their home right by the ferry landing because it was so convenient. They lived in New York. Bayard Street in downtown New York is obviously runs through so their property. So they were coming to the Burbs? Well, they were coming to the country. Yeah. This was their country oh, like Harlem. I mean, That's no, right. so when all the farms and Absolutely. They were up, up Exactly down. like Harlem or, or, or Brooklyn Heights. Right. This was the country. When they came here, they lived like a manorial family in England. I'm sure that Samuel Bayard probably thought this life would last forever. Well, you know, nothing lasts forever. Something called the American Revolution broke out. Mr. Bayard was a Tory. He backed the King of England. Needless to say, this does not bode well for its future in America. We've climbed up to Castle Point, the highest spot in town, and I cannot imagine a more remarkable view of the west side of Manhattan. I remember Barry as a kid driving the West Side Highway with my folks all the way from Wall Street up to the 80s. Oh, Docks yeah. and scores and scores of ocean liners and cargo France, ships. And all right, back to Hoboken. You can't say Hoboken without saying the family Stevens, oh. right? Actually, that's an understatement. I'm surprised they didn't call this Stevensville. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. See, Colonel John Stevens starts it all. This is he in his old age, but this man never aged. Oh, he lived into his 80s and was he a Renaissance man. Colonel, because he had served in the Revolutionary War. It's the 1780s. This property has been confiscated from the Bayards. Because he yep. went with they King They were on the George. wrong side. Mm -hmm. So Stevens buys it. And yes, he buys it as a country estate. But Stevens was the kind of man who didn't see land so much as he saw real estate. He then puts it up for sale. And frankly, nobody buys. And you know why? How do you get here? It's the age of sail. You have to get into a sailboat to come across the river, and you know sailboats, they're not too reliable. So you're not buying land over here, and he realizes he has to improve that transportation. And this taps into another side of this Renaissance man's brilliance. He was a natural-born engineer. Now, he considered himself a gentleman engineer the way that Jefferson considered himself a gentleman architect. They both dabbled, but they dabbled brilliantly. Stevens starts working on a steamboat. He's not the first one to do it. He's not the only one to do it. But he does come up with the twin propeller design in 1804 that will become the basis for modern steamboat design. And in that year, he creates the Little Juliana, which is not a totally successful steamboat, but it's well on its way to that. By the way, at this time, he also allies himself with his brother-in-law, Robert Livingston. But within a couple of years, there's a falling out between them. We don't know why. What Livingston does, he realizes himself with Robert Fulton. Right. And it is Fulton who's given the credit for the first steamboat, not Stevens. Also, Livingston and Fulton procure from New York State Legislature a monopoly to run steamboats on New York Harbor waters. This stymies John Stevens because he cannot send his steamboat to Manhattan. There can be no uh, fast connection between Manhattan and Hoboken. While that monopoly is in effect, he fights it. He does not win until Livingston dies, and this is already 1821. Once the monopoly is broken, Stevens realizes, now I can finally develop Hoboken. He 
sets Hoboken up as a resort for the wealthy of New York to come over here for a day, maybe for a weekend, maybe to have a house. Now remember, this was the 1820s. These people were not jogging, they were not skateboarding. They used to stroll for leisure time activity. So Stevens builds a riverfront promenade. He calls it River Walk. It begins at the ferry landing where Hoboken Terminal is today. It actually parallels the modern riverfront promenade that was only completed a few years ago. This is where River Walk rounds the promontory that Stevens built his house on. By the way, at the base of that promontory, he creates an artifact official cave he calls Sybil's Cave and he sells mineral water and then of course his guests will continue on Riverwalk until they reach their goal, that beautiful woods at the north end of Hoboken, Elysian Fields. On this breezy afternoon under a some 300 year old elm tree, uh, we're at the northern end of the Stevens Institute overlooking what used to be the Elysian Fields. What a great sound that has, Barry, the Elysian Fields. Well, I think the ancient Greeks would have agreed with you because that was their idea of heaven. And you only got in there, by the way, if Zeus tapped you on the shoulder and allowed you in. This Elysian Fields had a fee-paying cafe because it was owned by a Yankee, Colonel Stevens, and he wanted to make a bit of a profit. Here's that aerial view from the 1880s. Now, Hoboken's already developing, but you can still see the wooded Elysian fields at the northern end of the city. And standing at this northern end of the Stevens campus and looking at the trees that grow out of Elysian Park, you could almost get the feeling of the Elysian fields back in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Remember, the Colonel now could run his ferries across the river. He's developing Hoboken and as a resort for the elite. He builds the river walk from the ferry terminal uh, down below along the waterfront around his property uh, mm -hmm. up on the hill. And then, of course, his guests could finally reach Elysian Fields. Here's a print from the mid 19th century, probably even earlier, the 1830s. And it shows us we're in Elysian Woods. We're looking south. Uh, we're walking down the River Walk, and we're looking, by the way, towards what is now called Castle Point, with the Colonel's house from the 1780s there on top. Manhattan in the back. That's right. You know, the sons of the elite, especially the sports-minded ones, they used to come over here. There was a direct ferry service from New York to the Elysian Fields, so the sons of the wealthy did not have to mix with the hoi polloi middle class. One of the Colonel's sons, John Cox Stevens, he was one of the founders of the New York Yacht Club. And this is where they built the original clubhouse in the 1840s, down on the waterfront at the southern end of the woods of the Elysian Fields. John Cox and his brother Edwin, and a few other of the yachtsmen, threw their money together, built a racing sloop by the name of America, sent it over to England where it took part in a famous regatta, won that race, and, and they changed the name forever to um, the America's Cup. What a legacy. This is an 1856 print of the Hoboken cricket grounds. I can't believe as late as the mid-19th century we were so English in our sports. But it was changing. I mean, here you have a look at the Knickerbocker Nine, which is one of the two teams that played, most agree, the first baseball game played in the Elysian Fields uh, here in Hoboken in 1846. It evolved from cricket and then rounders, both British games. For instance, to get a guy out, they used to throw the ball and hit him with it. That was called soaking the batter, soaking the runner. But a couple of guys got together in 1845 here and wrote 20 new rules. First umpire, uh, three outs to an inning, three strikes to a batter, and there were a number of other rules as well. But that became the baseball pretty much that we know today and the first game played Hoboken, New Jersey. Now people may say, so what happened to this Elysian Fields? Well, uh, if you look over there where the first baseball game was played, it's now buried under the defunct Maxwell House coffee plant. The only green part left of Elysian Fields is Elysian Park, where in fact part of On the Waterfront was filmed. A lot of people would think, well, how sad to do away with this beautiful woods, to rip out nature and replace it with wharves and factories, but the Stevens, who owned all this property, well, for them, it was simply progress. We've talked about the legacies of the Stevens family, the biggest one, of course, being Hoboken itself. But there is another legacy that will be ongoing for 
generations and has been. Oh, absolutely, David. I think besides Hoboken, the Stevens Institute of Technology, where we are, is probably the Stevens family's greatest legacy. By 1871, the first building was open. Richard Upjohn was the architect. He did Trinity Church? Yes. Now, over the years, they've had amazing accomplishments, most of which I don't understand. (laughs) But two of them I do. One of the Stevens graduates created uh, bubble wrap, you know, the American version of the worry beads. And another one of the students was the co-designer of the Quonset Hut. Now, a third student we definitely know by name, Alexander Calder. He's the sculptor, the, the modern the sculptor. The mathematics of mobiles. And now I understand why all of his life he loved mobiles and stabiles, because basically they're mechanisms. Right. And speaking of uh, not understanding stuff, we are in this remarkable building. The director of the Davidson Laboratory is Dr. Michael Bruno. And Michael, nice to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, the Davidson Laboratory. What is this? What do you do here? What we do is naval architecture and ocean engineering design analysis, which you're looking at here behind me, affectionately is known as Tank 3. Actually, the first tank was the Stevens Swimming Pool. Back in the 1920s, Professor Davidson was studying the design of sailing yachts. He and Olin Stevens, one of the most famous yacht designers in history, teamed together back in the early 30s to design Harold Vanderbilt's America's Cup winning yacht, Ranger. And that's what brought a lot of acclaim to Davidson and his techniques and eventually led to the construction of this facility which uh, really played a prominent role in the Second World War. Give us an idea. What's the range of stuff that you design and test here? Um, In addition to virtually every America's Cup yacht since the 1937 campaign, um, the forerunner of the modern submarine, the Albacore, was largely designed here at Stevens. The space capsule for the Apollo program, 40 years ago they had originally designed the capsule flotation on a computer. We wouldn't trust that nowadays on a computer. And one of the engineers said, hey, let's do a scale model at Stevens. And they did that. And what they found was, unfortunately, the the flotation device would have had the capsule floating upside down 50% of the time. Then the flotation was redesigned, retested here, and that's what went up in the Apollo program. What we're going to see is a high-speed planing craft coming right at us. Uh, High-speed planing craft refers to a boat that's designed to ride high up on the water surface very low friction, very low drag, so achieve high speeds. How high speed? Uh, This one, at full scale, what you're going to see is representative of 20 miles per hour. Now notice the weight pattern coming out of the stern of the boat. You can tell a lot about the efficiency of the hull shape from that weight pattern. This town is all about transportation. How do you get in here? How do you get out of here? Well, the best way from experience is the water. This is why this spot we're in has become the major transportation hub of the city. Uh, this was the spit of land that jutted out into the river that made the, uh, the Bairds choose it for their own ferry slip. Actually, remember the Stevens moved their house in the 1780s up to Castle Point. Now, we've seen how the Stevens pioneered in steamboat technology, but they did not stay still for a second. I mean, as soon as the steamboat was on its way to perfection, the locomotive was coming in as the new thing, and they were going to perfect that as well. And this brings us to Robert Livingston Stevens. Robert Stevens inherited his father's mechanical ability, except this was a modern professional. He was trained. That's right. He wasn't an aristocratic dabbler, and he was an amazing fellow. He worked with his father in the 1820s in the development of America's first built locomotive. It was experimental. It, there it is. You know there's a replica of this in the Smithsonian Institution. And in 1826, they put it on a circular track near here. Another reason why New Yorkers had to come over to Hoboken to see this device, it was amazing. You just think about that, though. The first locomotive was here in Hoboken. And Robert Livingston Stevens had a great deal to do with it. You know what he's most famous for? He designed the modern railroad track, the T-track, that to this day is used universally throughout the world. Now, he was not interested in a toy. He was interested in making money, expanding... like his dad. That's right. So, he and his brother Edwin, they decide 
they want to tap into the New York to Philadelphia travel market that was the heaviestly traveled route in the country at that time. You know, back in the 18th century, it took you two days to get from New York to Philadelphia. Well, Edwin and Robert knew if they could hook into that Philadelphia to New York route, they could make a fortune. So they wanted to create, and they did, America's first commercial railroad. They had to actually go to England. The English were ahead of us at that point. They bring back, or I should say Robert, brings back the John Bull. He immediately sets to work on improving it. By the late 1830s, they had reduced two days to a miraculous five and a half hours. Actually, today, on a bad day on the Jersey Turnpike, it takes you that still. Now, that railroad would eventually be absorbed into the Penzi, the, the Great Pennsylvania Railroad. These fellows basically pioneered Hoboken's use as a railroad terminal city. By the 1880s, other railroads were coming east. And think about it, David, there's a reason why the Hoboken and Jersey City shoreline on the Hudson became host to a series of great railroad terminals by the 1880s because we are basically at the end of the continental United States. And it's the gateway to the west. That's right. On this site was the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western. Don't you? Do you miss the names of these railroads, the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe? They had a sense of place. By 1907, a couple of those railroads merge into the Erie Lackawanna. They pull down the old terminal. They hire Kenneth Murchison, a Beaux-Arts trained architect, and he puts up this amazing railroad terminal and ferry transfer point. We were on the train platform. We walked through the beautiful waiting room, came up the stairs to this magnificent grand concourse. It obviously needs a little work but it is magnificent. And it's also huge, why? Because back in the days of train to ferry, as many as 100,000 people would come through this hall to go to the boats. Murchison was a Beaux-Arts American trained architect. He understood both elegance and practicality. That's why this was so efficiently designed as a transfer hub. Now, the skin of the building's all copper. He took the 16th century Renaissance Italian work and he metallicized it for the 20th century. Then you enter that waiting room that, oh, they, they've done a beautiful job restoring that from the, from the limestone wainscot to the Tiffany skylight to that incredible clock that the sun comes gleaming through. And then you would come through the waiting room and come up the stairs into this level, into this concourse, which is probably as wide as a football field and certainly longer. Yeah, a lot longer. And it was so efficiently designed, the ferries in those days were double-decker. Below us was the carriages and the horses. Here were the passengers, pedestrians, and that is why this is a double-decker ferry depot. And by the way, this is completely can't do leave it out over the water. <laughs> oh, amazing work. All right, this is before tunnels. That's right. Before the G George Washington Bridge. But within three years of this being built, by 1910, there are three railroad tunnels leading into Manhattan. One is the Pennsylvania Railroad going to Penn Station. But for local Jersey people, for Hoboken people, by 1909, you have two Hudson and Manhattan tubes, we call it the PATH trains, taking you from here in Hoboken to Midtown, downtown Manhattan, a subway just as if you were living in Brooklyn. But you know, by the 1920s, we're shifting to cars. By 1927, they open up the Holland Tunnel. By 31, the George Washington Bridge. By 37, the Lincoln Tunnel. All for cars. All for cars. By the 1950s, so much of mass transit is being disassembled, allowed to, to mold. Jersey was doing exactly like the rest of the country. But today, there's an amazing plan here in northeastern Jersey for bringing back mass transit for Again, people. with Hoboken as a key. As the key is right, this Hoboken high-tech trolley system is soon going to be extended around the western edge of Hoboken and it's amazing. This puts not only northeast New Jersey but Hoboken within very easy shot of New York City. Really Hoboken, the towns around it, they are becoming the de facto sixth borough of New York City. oldest building on the waterfront. Uh, it was built in the late 1880s and for some 100 years was a maritime machine shop, but now is the exquisitely restored Hoboken Historical Museum. This museum is not new. It was founded in 1986, but this space is new. It was offered to them in 2001. 
a hundred years for a dollar? I'd love to have that rent. This is about two bays of the original machine shop building, which runs actually for two full city blocks now from 12th to 14th Street. Right. Uh, here's a 1904 view of the uh, Hoboken waterfront. We can see where we are right now at the northern end of town. W and A Fletcher and Company built their complex. But another thing this shows you is how much this waterfront has changed since that first baseball game back in 1846. And what show could more reflect Hoboken than one of maritime art? Oh, oh, true. The show they have now is of Antonio Jacobson's work. He was a ship's portraitist from the 1880s to the 1910s, which really was the greatest era of prosperity for industrial Hoboken. He did these portraits, and he considered himself a businessman, not an artiste. Right. So he was efficient, he was reliable, he was quick, and he got you a portrait for $5 a pop. And they really reflect the fact that Hoboken has always been a river city. And in this period, we're talking about now from the 1860s to the 1970s, this great industrial period, the last factory that was built on the waterfront is right next door, the now defunct Maxwell House coffee plant. Wonderful industrial modern styling. And for those people who lived here during the 50 years that that plant was open, everyone brings up the fact that when they they got up in the morning, they could smell Maxwell House coffee <laughs> wafting right. through the air. But if we were over in Manhattan, we had a different view. Well, we all knew about it because they had this huge neon sign stretching out over the factory. We could see it from all over the west side, especially when we came down the west side highway. Right. And there across the river, Maxwell House, good to the last drop. Right. When the factory closed in 1992, most of that sign was destroyed. But there's one part of that sign left, and the Hoboken Historical Museum has it, a 200-pound, 12-foot last drop. From the middle 1800s on, the sailing ships, the steam ships, were really the, the, the engines that made Hoboken just come alive and hum. That's absolutely true. During the industrial era, this waterfront was the basis for the fortunes of Hoboken. Now, in the 1850s or 60s, we, we, we get a revolution in steamship travel. Steamship piers were being built here and in, on the Manhattan side of the river. But they had sails. Well, they had sails because, number one, they didn't trust the steam engine yet. And number two, by the way, if it was a windy day, they figured, let's save money, stop the steam engines and use the sails. But this meant, instead of that two-month trip, these steamships guaranteed that in seven to ten days, you would be in Europe. Now, most, most of these steamship lines were over on the other side of the river. Of course, they were over on the west side of Manhattan, on the Hudson River piers. Hamburg American broke away from that. They understood most of America was coming from this side of the Hudson. Why should they have to cross the Hudson River? Uh, by 1904, when this print is made, this aerial print, you can see that the entire Hoboken waterfront is devoted to shipping, to commerce. Here at the southern end of the city, that's where the Hamburg American Line was located, right next to the Hoboken Terminal. Next to them was North German Lloyd, and the others followed suit. And you know, when we think of this great age of steamship travel to Europe, it lasted about 100 years till the 1960s, we think of the Vanderbilts and the Astors. But you know how these steamship lines really made their money? From steerage class. This era coincided with the great immigration from Europe. These steerage passengers paid, I believe, 10 bucks. They were given no amenities, and so the steamship lines made a fortune off of them. Actually, the German lines catered to the steerage class. And needless to say, who would be in steerage in a German boat but German immigrants? When they come here, they're already skilled, they're educated, they move right into mainstream America. In Hoboken, they move to the top of the social ladder. They immediately become the elite of Hoboken. Their golden era here in Hoboken, it coincided with the great era of Hoboken's industrial time. It was 1880s to the 1910s that Hoboken prospered. Every decade, more people. Every decade, more money. The Germans were on top of a city that was going onward and upward. They must have thought that their cultural life here, that wonderful life they had, would last forever. But mm. World War I happened, and suddenly everything changed. Mid-teens, the world's at war, President Wilson declares war on Germany, so 
What happens to Hoboken? Well, the second thing the president did after he declared war was make Hoboken the main port of embarkation for all of our doughboys, our soldiers who were going overseas. The third thing the president did was seize the German liners and the German steamship properties here on the waterfront in Hoboken. So declared war against the German community here and all of Actually, Africa. in World War I, the federal government treated the German Americans the way they will the Japanese Americans in World War II. All the German organizations, they are closed down. Germans are deported. By the end of the war, the German community is gone. But in the 18 months, we only were at war a year and a half, two million American soldiers came through Hoboken. Uh, you could see them at any moment on the streets of Hoboken. Was marching. this the heyday of Hoboken? Oh, oh, this was the glory moment of Hoboken. Uh, here's the man who led us to victory, General John Pershing. He came back through Hoboken. You know, the motto of the war is attributed to him, Heaven, Hell, or Hoboken by Christmas. He got his wish. November 11th, 1918, the war is over. We've seen these guys yes, before. Yes, we have. Remember when we did Harlem? This is the Fighting 369th, the Harlem Hellfighters. They're here coming through Hoboken, victorious on their way back from France. They're getting ready to march up Fifth Avenue in that special parade given for them in February Even of Even today, one of the great parades in the history yes. of New York. Yes, it was. Well, you know, the war's over. Hoboken wakes up, looks around, it's 1920, and realizes the world has changed and it's actually beginning to pass the city vibe for the next 40, 50 years, Hoboken goes downhill. World War II is a slight break in that, but by the 1950s, when a certain film company showed up to do a movie here that is going to make cinematic history here in America, its great glory days had long since passed it by. On the Waterfront is one of the most powerful movies ever made. The first major motion picture ever shot entirely on location. And except for one shot that was done in Brooklyn, the entire movie was shot right here in Hoboken. And one of the many powerful scenes in the movie was shot right here by this fence. Uh, Carl uh, Malden playing a priest, Marlon Brando playing a longshoreman. And Brando has been involved with setting up the murder of one of the other longshoremen. I want you to believe me when I tell you I just thought they was going to lean on him a little bit. I never figured it was going to knock him off. And what the priest is saying to Brando is in this scene, you've got to tell Edie, played by Eve Marie Saint, who won an Oscar, by the way, along with Brando, uh, that you were part of this setup. And also, you've got to go testify before the crime commission. But you know, if I spill my life, I ain't worth a nickel. And how much is your soul worth if you don't? Basically, it was the baby of... Elia Kazan and Bud Schulberg. Now, Kazan had just done Streetcar Named Desire. He soon would do East of Eden. Oh, what great movies. Schulberg had read in, in its articles by Malcolm Johnson about the corruption in the Longshoremen's Unions. And through those articles, he got in contact with this fascinating character who came out of Hell's Kitchen, New York. And this character was a fighting Irish priest by the name of John Corridan, Father John. Tough guy. Carl Malden really caught him beautifully. Now, what was the problem? Well, most of his parishioners were longshoremen, and their worst enemy was their union. It was the International Longshoremen's Association, the ILA, and basically it was a bunch of thugs. And the way they had power over the longshoremen was through the shape-up. Now, what was the shape-up? It was where the guys who needed a job, the longshoremen, this is where they would be picked for a day's work. Hey, who do you see to get a day's pay Give me a break, man. Mike. Well, the union rep only picked the guys who kicked back money. Uh, or if you didn't get picked and you needed money, oh yeah, they'd love to loan it for you at exorbitant rates. They also shook down the companies and they stole cargo directly from the pier. So they were a lovely bunch. If you went up against them, you were lucky if you had your ribs broken. Most likely they threw you off of, of a building or they dropped a cargo on you, which is what happens to two characters in the movie. So what was the movie saying? Well, America in the 50s was not just Father Knows Best and, and uh, Ozzie and Harriet. The cities in America were emptying out. Cities like Hoboken, Detroit, St. Louis, they were emptying out. Every day, people were leaving for the suburbs. Businesses were leaving. In 1954, when that movie was made, if you looked out over Hoboken, you could really say, is there a future in this city?
I lived in Hoboken 56 years. You have to have good pigeons first yeah, if you want to race pigeons. They're just uh, like racehorses. I love the, the quietness and, uh, and it's just like therapy. I tell you, last year you won the 500 miles. And the trail of it is, when you see your pigeon come home and it's diving and then they close their wings and it's like a, so exciting that you, you, they did all this for you. Come on, come on, come on, get in. It's a dying game. You know what I mean? Ain't, like he says, I'm the last person in Hoboken. In Hoboken, there must have been 25 people. We had that club down there. Every night, we stood there until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, drinking, talking about pigeons. You know what I mean? It was fun. It's not a real pigeon scene. It's just a coop that they put together, and they bought some birds out of a bird store. The movie, I must have watched a hundred times because of the pigeons. You know what I mean? I love Hoboken. You know, I mean, I've been here all my life, and it's really a nice town. This is like I grew up with a. This brings back memories. Oh, he brings back memories for me too. Ladies, hi. Hello, welcome. Now well, wait, your sisters? Yes. Hey, who's who? I'm Dottie. <laughs> and how do you happen to be here in this place? What is this place? Since 1931, this is our store. It's the second oldest business on Washington Street. Why keep it like this? My mother didn't believe in modernizing. And she's only been gone like 10 years, so it's, you know, it's always been like this, so we just left it. What was it like when you were growing up in Hoboken? The family town. And nobody had to leave Hoboken to go to work. There were a million jobs in the factories and everything. And you, you, could, you, know, the corner. you could spend your whole life in Hoboken. So what happened? The companies moved away. Yeah. Maxwell House left. Lipton Tea left. Wonder Bread left. Hostess Cupcakes left. Tootsie Rolls left. Yeah, everybody left. Tell us about your mom and dad. Very hardworking German people. My father was an apprentice at an ice cream parlor. He worked at an ice cream parlor in Jersey City. And this one came on the market in a buying bankruptcy sale. And they bought it. And everyone said, you won't make a go of it either. But they didn't know my parents. <laughs> and they were only married one year. Yeah. And in 1931, they started. My mother could hardly speak English, but she learned very quickly. <laughs> Her first big, big lesson was how to say sarsaparilla. She didn't even, <laughs> she didn't know what that was. Did she learn to say sarsaparilla? Oh, she learned to say everything. She was very smart and determined. Now, how old were you all when you oh, became a Oh, we weren't born winner? then. We were born here. Well, not right here, but. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much for inviting us in. It's a, it's a treat. It's very nice yes, to meet thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank lovely. you. So out of Schnackenberg, onto this wide, beautiful street, and if it weren't for all these cars, it almost looks, Barry, like we're back in the, what, late 1800s. Well, I think that's what brought Hoboken back in the late 20th century. Uh, this Washington Street, you know, this is such a charming street, wide sidewalks, perfect place to stroll. Back in the 1970s, it may not have looked so spiffy, but it certainly had the feeling, the bones of a 19th century street. It's probably what pulled people over from New York City to begin with. When you come up Washington Street, it goes the entire length of the city, from the Hoboken Terminal at one end to the Lipton Tea Factory Complex at 14th Street. Uh, and coming out of the terminal, as you walk up Washington, immediately on the left is going to be City Hall. This is a view of the original City Hall in 1881. They rebuilt it in 1911 as we see it today. As you come up Washington, on the right at 7th is uh, Trinity Church. I call it Trinity. It's All Saints Episcopal today, but that's a charming country-style English church. Further north on Washington, as it gets more residential, here, this block between 9th and 10th, and now you get to 12th Street. You see this stretch of apartments? It's the Yellow Flats from 1890 between 12th and 13th on the right side of the street. Now, as I walk around Hoboken, I think to myself, this is really a company town. 
the company I'm thinking of, of course, is the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company. And it was at least three, maybe four generations of Stevens that worked through that company to create the town we see. You know, Edwin, who ran it in the middle of the century, he dies in 1868, but it's his widow, Martha, Martha Bayard Stevens, who outlives him by 30 years. She understood what her father-in-law wanted, that you should not just be a developer, but a benefactor, a patron to your town. It was Martha Stevens who made sure the company set aside three of the four main parks that we have here in Hoboken. Uh, you know, on the north side of Church Square Park is the Hoboken Public Library. Martha Stevens helped to found that library. Was she responsible for the workers' housing? Willow Terrace yeah, over by yeah. Willow and 7th, absolutely. She was fascinated by workers' housing. We saw that in Brooklyn. Here, it's more low-keyed, of course, lower scale, little 12 and a half foot wide houses stretched along those two muses. Huh? By the 1920s, the Stevens are out of here. By the 1940s, the company itself is out of here. But it was done. They right? did their work, that's right. They did their work. And when you look around Hoboken today and you appreciate the, the walkability, you appreciate the fact it's a low-rise city. It's a city really for a post-suburban generation. It's a city, but it's, it's, it's livable. I think we can really appreciate what the Stevens did for this town. Most cities can claim at least a celebrity or two. Hoboken claims a whole bunch, and they, they're across the board. Arts, music, photography, you name it. it it's amazing. Uh, two people who came out of the German-American community that we've spoken about and was brought up in that culture of, of the Germans. One was Alfred Stieglitz, who was born in the 1860s. The other was Dorothea Lang, who was born in the 1890s, both here in Hoboken. Both went on to become great photographers. Alfred Stieglitz, by the turn of the 20th century, his views of New York of that era. I think every restaurant in the Flatiron District has an Alfred Stieglitz photograph of the Flatiron Building. Right. Dorothea Lang was the chronicler in photos of the Depression in the 1930s, especially in the rural areas of America. Sharecroppers, tenant farmers, her 1936 photo, Migrant Mother. That is probably the iconic photo to tell us about the Depression and its miseries. Napoleon III, Emperor of France, lived in Hoboken. This is one of the great stories, by the <laughs> way, but go ahead. You, you thought I was bringing you to the wrong side of the Hudson. Uh, he was here in 1846 to 1848. Uh, he was in political exile. When he left here, he went right to France to be part of that revolution that put him on the throne as emperor. While he was emperor, he's the man who created the boulevards that makes Paris the Paris it is. And then... Hey, yo, Napoleon, <laughs> here Last but not least is the fellow whose house we're standing just about in front of, back there, 601 Bloomfield Avenue. This is where Stephen Foster lived. He lived here just over a year, middle of the 1850s. He was one of the classic 19th century American composers. While he was here in this house, he composed Jeannie with the light brown hair. He's known for O oh Susanna, my old Kentucky home. So many people think they're folk songs. They're not. They were composed by Foster. He's also known very controversially for his minstrel music. And it's a very complicated subject, but really he's the first white American to appreciate black music and to showcase it to the American public. You know, he was from the North. I mean, he's not like yes, from Hoboken, but from Pennsylvania. And these are all these quintessential songs about the American South. And people think he's from the South, but he was not. He was, a, that's right. But Jeannie with light brown hair. I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair, born like a vapor on the summer air. I see her tripping where the bright streams play, happy as the daisies that dance on her way. We spent most of our time over on the ritzy part of town. Now we're on the other side of Willow Avenue, the other side of the track, so what was going on here? We are over here at 3rd and Adams. This is the old swamp area. We this is what the Stevens sold off. That's right, they didn't want it. What would they want it for? Well, what is it going to be used for? Factories. Well, into this area comes Kufel and Esser. 
two German-American boys from the neighborhood, from, from Hoboken. In 1867, they form K&E. First, they import precision instruments from Germany for architects, engineers, draftsmen. By the 1880s, the K&E boys are manufacturing their own instruments, and that's what they needed these factories for. The building on the right, which is still standing, right on the third, this is uh, the K&E building and the older one. There was another one on this site that burned, replaced by the building that we see in front of us. A uh, beautiful example, by the way, of this turn of the 20th century type of urban factory, multi-story, very constricted by the street grid. Look at the catalog from the early 1900s. Here is, here is a slide rule. Everybody of a certain generation in the engineering architectural fields, they all had to have slide rules. And you are going to teach all of us right now how to use a slide rule. I stick, had aren't never you? figured out how to use a slide rule. I could stare at it from now till kingdom come. I, you needed a brain for this. You know, but that wasn't all. They didn't just do these engineering things. Of course, during World War I and II, they supplied periscopes to the Navy and also grew spiders in the basement to get their strands to make crosshairs and gun sights. And how many people know that those were actual pieces of spider webbing that they used to make crosshairs and gun sights oh, from K&E? Well, so what's happened with all of this in, in all these years to come? The by the time you get to the 1950s and 60s, these factories are hopelessly outmoded. K&E in the 1960s moves to the suburbs like so many of these factory companies did. By the way, some of these empty buildings in the 1950s were filled with garment center type operations, sweatshops, let's face it, and they pulled in a new population, a Latino population, you know, the women, the Latina women, they were often the employees. 50 years later, the Latino population is still here, still going strong. It originally was Puerto Rican, now it's a pan-Latino population. And this building, by the way, the Clock Tower building, in 1976, it made American history. This was one of the first old American factory buildings to be recycled into a new use, recycled into housing. So when I cook, I throw the hot water in, it'll cook evenly, you know? This is 190 degrees, this is about 200 to 225. You know, you get used to it after 30 some years, you don't feel the heat no more, you know? Now she's all coming together, she'll come out nice and smooth. Pick it up, stretch it. Cut it. And that's the twist. And that's what it looks immigration. The story of Hoboken is immigration. A lot of talk here in Hoboken, naturally, appropriately, about Frank Sinatra and his being Italian. But the Italians are only part of this fabric. And you're right about that. Now, we're here on Garden Street, and for good reason, but we'll get to that in a moment. We've already talked about the German-American community and how much they gave to Hoboken. When the Germans came to America, well, so did the Irish. This was the 1830s, 40s, 50s. But if the Germans came here skilled, the Irish came here totally uneducated because that is how the English wanted them. So the Irish started at the bottom of the ladder. And just like in the rest of America, they worked their way up by the 1880s. They're the firemen, they're the policemen, they're the politicians. And they're beginning to move to the uptown part of Hoboken. Who comes in back of them? The Italians. 
And first it's the Northern Italians in the 1850s. By the 1880s, it's the Southern Italians. You know, those two groups did not get along. And that friction between those groups played itself out in the story of the marriage of Frank Sinatra's parents. And now his mother was what, the North? She was Northern Italian. She fell in love with a Southern Italian boy. Her parents weren't happy. Married down. It yes, married down. Married down. Right. Well, they moved into a tenement in the middle of Monroe Street, in, in, right in the heart of, of Hoboken's Little Italy. It was the worst part of town. Dolly was a very bright and ambitious woman, and she was going to get her family out of Little Italy, and she did. You see, she was very well spoken in English. You know how many of the Italians back then didn't speak English? Well, she parlayed that into a political role by becoming chummy chummy with the uh, Irish politicians in uptown Hoboken. She was the conduit, ultimately, of the Italian vote to the Irish politicians. This is a view of the site of the tenement that Frank Sinatra was born in in 1915 and burned in 1967. They tore it down. It's long gone. Here's the uh, church he was baptized in at 300 Jefferson, St. Francis Church. Again, anyone who knows Hoboken knows years ago that that was really in the nasty part of town. But Dolly is going to get her kid out. And when Frank was 12 years old, so that would be 1927, they moved to a house, 703 Park Avenue. She has broken the Willow Avenue barrier. She's come Got out of out. downtown into uptown within a year in 1928. They're right over here, 841 Garden. Remember, Frank was 13 years old. Do you notice the direction she's going in? If you know Hoboken, every move a little further north and a little further east, because that was the right way to go. Mm -hmm. He lived here from 13 until he was 19. When he marries at 19, he moves to Jersey City. But you know, he did what all Americans did. He moved on, he moved up, and he moved out. <laughs> Cheesesteaks. If I don't have cheesesteaks, I might as well close the door. Some people have been coming here 15, 20 years and don't know that our menu is slightly diverse. They really don't know. They say, what, you got sausage? You have meatballs? You have roast beef? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I said, well, you live under a rock all your life. That's not my fault. Piccolo's isn't in Hoboken. Piccolo's is Hoboken. And Sparky's able to tell us the whole story because this this is the story of you this is your life isn't it <laughs> this is your, your life, life sparky well let's we'll start off my name is joseph spacavento but they call me sparky for short i was born in italy i came here in 1937 in november it was cold and i had short pants when i came and i remember i was a kid we used to play across the street we used to play box ball we used to play stick ball i lived 109 clinton street I lived around this section all my life till I got married, then I went away three, three blocks away. After that, we moved four blocks away, but still in Hoboken. I never leave Hoboken. This is my town, just like Frank Sinatra's town. Tell me about the restaurant. Well, the restaurant right here, well, I was a butcher until I guess I was around 23 years old. And I want to go into the food business. We opened up May the 3rd. 1955. Describe Patty. Describe what it's like for somebody to come into your restaurant, into Piccolo's, and and and, well, and meet up well, with me, Patty. Let me tell you something about Patty. He's got his own way. Sometimes he'll throw you out if he's, <laughs> and sometimes he's like a little lamb. I think my mother had me under the counter. I think I was born right there. She was waiting on a customer and said, wait a minute, I'm having a baby, and uh, I've been here a long time. I've been here since I'm eight or nine years old. My father's a tough man. He can be a fair man at times. Not with me, of course, but with other people. And you do things his way. Most of the time, his way is the right way when it comes to business and when it comes to life. A little while ago, you mentioned a man named Frank Sinatra. Who, who, who is this Frank Sinatra person? Frank Sinatra is my man. He's my one and only. He's my entertainer. Frank Sinatra, I've been following Frank Sinatra since I was a kid. Believe me. I used to, every time he came to the Paramount, 
to make that early show. I didn't go to school to make that early show for 50 cents. Oh, and hang around all day there until you get kicked out from the ushers. That's right. Uh, I missed so much school because it. of Sinatra that I could have been maybe a doctor today. But I hear Sinatra is played in he, here. He's my entertainer. He plays here from 11 o'clock in the morning till 4.30 to when we close up. It's Sinatra. And that's it. Frank Sinatra, and that's it. That's it for Hoboken. Final thoughts? I think Hoboken's a charmer. So, come stroll Hoboken. You'll be glad you did. For Barry and me, for all of us at the walking tours, make it a good evening. Want to know more about Hoboken? Log on to 13.org.